Hey everyone. Uh, so we have an exceptional guest here with us today. So everyone dreams about working with Fang companies, uh, with one of the Fang companies once in their lifetime. But the guest we have with us today has worked with two Fang companies, and he is here with us to share his exceptional journey of how he started his journey from an intern. and he has jumped ranks from there so he will share his exceptional journey with us today and i'll give the stage to gorov uh, who is our guest today so gorov the stage is yours hey thanks to all thanks for having me here yeah and thanks for the wonderful introduction uh yeah i think you overshot it but still i'm happy you said that so gorov can you uh, give some introduction about your life journey how have you uh, reached where you are today yeah so i basically i started my career with amazon in 2017 as an intern so before that i was just in college uh, i've graduated from nit jalandhar i was uh, i was pursuing my btech in electronics and communication and like most of us i was just working towards improving my data structure and algorithm abilities while i was in college and uh yeah mostly focused on code chef that time and code forces here and there so amazon came to our campus for intern hiring and that's where my journey started so i got hired as an intern in amazon i did my two months of internship in 2017 in amazon hyderabad then i got pre placement offer so i had a pretty chill last final year of my college where i did kind of nothing just chilled around with my friends because i was kind of already placed towards the beginning and then yes i joined Amazon in 2018 I worked for the Amazon business team I got to SD2 in 2020 and then again worked till mid of 2021 so spent around 3 year 3 or 2 months in Amazon and then uh I thought like it's a good it's a good time to start interviewing to other places because uh the industry at that time was pretty rewarding there was a hiring boom going on and I gave a few interviews. I mostly interviewed for Google, Uber, and Facebook. So I got through Uber and Facebook, both of them. But I was down leveled in Google, so I kind of didn't pursue that opportunity. Uh, I decided to join Uber initially because I had my Meta offer as well. But due to due to COVID at that time, the onboardings were delayed by a bit, like six to seven months. So I kind of joined Uber for like a brief period of six months. a uh, pretty different interview experiences i would say we can talk about that later but then yeah i worked for just 6 months in uber because i kind of wanted to join meta in london and i just was like getting my time gone through there so worked there for 6 months then went to uh meta i joined the data portability team in meta which was working for both facebook and instagram worked there for an about an year and then i wanted to move to the us from the very beginning mostly because of better earning opportunities and i wasn't getting that opportunity in meta because of the hiring freeze and amazon and meta was there were internal news that meta was start, starting to lay off people and there won't be any lateral movements so that time i once again got an opportunity from amazon they reached out to me again so that's how i joined amazon once again and now i'm working in amazon seattle yeah that's quite a journey from you Okay. So tell me uh you said that you pursued electrical and electronics in NIT. Yeah. So uh you're working as a software developer but uh you did not study anything about uh that field in your college to be particular right? So how did you land an internship at Amazon as a software developer while you had no background? Yeah, I wouldn't say I had no background. There were So the curriculum in electronics and communication engineering in BTEC first year we had the C programming language and BTEC second year we had C++ or object oriented programming as well as operating systems so which kind of developed a background for me and in the fourth semester I had data structures and algorithms as one of the subjects so I kind of had all the all the courses covered in terms of data structures operating systems languages so it it had built my base well Additionally uh there was a good culture in my college at that time of competitive programming so specifically people in computer science electronics and IT were 
kind of pretty much enthusiastic towards it. So the culture also contributed towards it a lot. That, that's what I would say. That's good. And uh, so, uh, is there any difference between an uh, intern's interview and a full time's interview? Is it easier to get into internship? Yeah, I think uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews for Amazon. I've done about hundred of them. Uh, lit. I I can tell you what the scenario right now is. I think right now the interns kind of go through in Amazon. I'll talk about Amazon and overall what happens in industry as well. So in internships, generally, we generally do an online, online coding test. It's basically a hacker rank test in which you get a couple of questions around data structures and algorithms and uh, a few questions around system design. There isn't a need to be scared about system design because it's a vast topic for interns. It's mostly around questions like uh, what is cap theorem kind of stuff so that it just takes your basics if you're coming as an intern. Uh, after that, you there is one of the engineers just go through your code which you have written, which it cleared the hacker and test cases, but still people go through your code just to ensure that you know what is the quality of code that you write. So it's important that you write good quality code in terms of you're not just writing code to make your test cases work, but the variable namings are good, how the way you structure your code is good. Did you use a optimal algorithm in this or not? So these kind of things. So based upon that, we just screen candidates. And nowadays we just do a single interview round for interns, which is a pretty holistic round in which we ask interns a few of few questions from their experience on how they have done certain things and what were the situations they encountered, which required certain aspects like they had to dive deep or they had to show ownership if they haven't done any internship in the past, otherwise it's just fine. Uh, then we also go for some coding questions, one, generally one coding question. And apart from that, we ask some computer science fundamentals as well. Computer science fundamentals can be somewhere around something like what are semaphores, how they will differ from mutex. When do you know you want to apply a semaphore or not? Can you give me a real life example? Stuff like that. Just to check like the candidate just not only understands the definitions, but also the real meaning behind them. So that's just single round, which is happening after screening for internships. Uh, I think it's a bit easier to get in as an intern rather than an SD one, because in SD one, the interviews are more thorough. So in SD ones, we generally go for four interview rounds instead of just one, which is for an intern. So for an SD one, we generally go for uh, three coding rounds and all of them have leadership principles or some questions around your background asked upon and then we generally have a bar raiser round in which the bar raiser might, might ask you some coding question just talk about your journal experience leadership principles or may ask you some small low level design as well like can you develop a few classes for me which do this this and this just to see that you can write code which is not just data structures and algorithms but also like object oriented code right and you mentioned uh like uh, you ask some experience questions like what did you do in your internship or what challenges you face so in case uh, the intern the person who applied for the internship he does not know uh, like he does not have any experience about internship so he can explain some instances from his college life right oh yeah definitely yeah. like a lot of people have are applying for their first internship ever and mm -hmm. so i think any I, i've seen also people just talking about how they have taken ownership in their real life, just not about in terms of how they have done. So it may be like, if I'm asking someone like, can you tell me about an instance where you took some ownership? It's not necessary that uh, you have to tell me about a project. It can be, it can be any personality trait. Like I've seen people give me an example, just I took ownership when I was organizing my college fest and stuff like that. It just kind of indicates that you at least understand what that means and you have that thing in you. But right. it generally, it's good that you mentioned something from your projects because uh, the interview can kind of gauge your technical experience as well, like what you have done in general. But it's totally fine if you don't have any, don't make up any, I would say. Give right. any college examples. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So let's say you got into uh, an intern role. Let's say any company. 
So, uh, what are the roles that you perform as an intern at Amazon? What, what, mm-hmm. what are so? Are you assigned a real life project, or you are assigned some other kind of work? What What are they expecting? Because I I believe an internship is a short period of time, two to four months. So you cannot expect a lot of things getting done at a big company like Amazon or Meta. So what are your uh, what are the expectations from an intern? Yeah. So while we get an intern. there are two preferences for us we personally try to give them a project which after doing which they feel like valued or they feel like they have contributed something for example we won't we generally don't try to give them projects which would never be used because it's kind of waste of time for them for us and they don't feel like they made an impact so it's generally a project which can be con- which can be done in that particular tenure so let's say we have got a two or three month intern so we before the intern comes they generally have a week of starting week of onboarding plan in which they go through amazon's certain stuff like how do we build code or how do we raise code reviews and how how do the, like how do we set up packages and stuff like that and the last week is just for their presentations of what they did sharing the ideas with the team and the other people which were not in the team of what they have accomplished and the middle period of 6 7 weeks is when they perform their project we generally try to assign them a mentor right before they join and the responsibility of the mentor is to get them up to speed to resolve any road blockers they might have and to provide them with a already well understood project so in for generally for a two month intern we kind of try to do ensure that there is not much ambiguity which is left for them to resolve it's just something which we know this is what you need to do and then intern just kind of executes it there is a reason behind that because the tenure is so short and they are so new to the company that they might feel frustrated or they might feel anxious because most of the interns on the back of their mind want a replacement offer and they want to get the task done and if they kind of get stuck it kind of builds up frustration in them so we kind of try to give them a well sorted project right. but when it's a, it comes for a 6 month intern they graduate they comparatively had lot they have a lot more time so we try to give them a problem in which they have to research a bit so we give them a bit a problem and then in which maybe the solution is not defined yet so they have to search for a solution we give them the ideas like hey this is the these are the possible solutions they kind of explore them discuss it with the team and then come up with a solution and then implement it so it's kind of more of a full fledged project for a 6 month intern okay so about the replacement offer uh, that you get so does amazon want you guys to get a replacement offer from them because they have invested a lot or is there a competition amongst interns or something like that like is it difficult to get a replacement offer or it gets easier uh, once you intern for them i think uh, it kind of totally depends upon your performance like amazon always would want to for for example current now rightly i think like amazon is just hiring sd ones through the return to, return interns returning interns they're not hiring industry st ones so which kind of emphasizes the fact that uh the pre getting a pre placement offer is kind of important and you get always get the preference as well and it's kind of good for you as well because you are kind of introduced to the ecosystem so when you join it's you can start delivering like within a month as compared to a new hire who will like take 2 3 months to ramp up and start delivering so it's better for the teams as well and amazon tries to kind of do that as well like they try to bring you in the same team in you inter- in which you interned with it's not a guarantee because that particular team might not be having a rec available so it's mostly they try to fit it and fit you into the same place you were in or somewhere around that so that you can start delivering as fast as possible okay yeah makes sense yeah. that yeah so you uh, as you mentioned that you have interviewed with different all different kinds of companies Uh, meta facebook yeah. facebook is meta google yeah. uber and amazon so what mm-hmm. are the differences that you see amongst these companies and the process of interviews and if you had to rate from the most difficult to the easiest what what would that be uh, what would that order be for you yeah 
uh, I can talk about the different experiences first. I think uh, Google is Google and Facebook is still kind of taking those lead code or data structure kind of interviews a lot. So their emphasis is still on those lead code problems. Whereas I have seen I've seen a big transition in how Uber and Amazon is interviewing these days. So when I interviewed with Google and Meta, their questions were totally around data structure. So when I interviewed at Meta, I had like uh, five interview rounds, including the phone screen. And I was expected to in complete two coding questions in each of the rounds. So I had, I had just back to back five coding rounds and just one design round, the system design round. Uh, in Google, I had four interview rounds apart from the phone screen. They sometimes wave off the phone screen based upon how well the interviewer thinks you're prepared. Or sometimes the Google recruiter asks you some questions right away during the call <laughs> to gauge like how much experience do you have? And yeah. they kind of wave the, the phone call based on the telephonic interview based upon that. So I had four coding, four rounds, three of them were Three of them were completely coding. And the fourth one was a Googliness round, which was around their leadership principles. Okay. So again, Facebook, Google, everything coding questions. Facebook just had one system design round. And Google asks you whether you want to give a system design round or you want to give a coding round. Totally depends upon you. Okay. But currently what I've seen in Amazon is the emphasis on the lead code style problems or the coding data structure type problems have has gone slightly down. Like for example, if you're hiring for SD2 positions these days, if you're taking four rounds, there is only one round which is around proper coding of data structures and algorithms. The second round is mostly around the low level design. We want to check how are you able to write a industry level program code or are you able to define the classes that are needed? Are you able to Make, write a classes in a way which are extensible. Are you able to write classes in a way in which you can make further changes without modifying the external, the current structure of the code much? So, and how do you disambiguate the problem? So we kind of give them a problem, which is not well defined. We expect them to define the problem and come up with the classes, how the classes interact and how would you test the code? So this is something which has changed. And then we go for a system design round in which we do a proper high level system design. And then there is a bar razor round and the bar razor is free to kind of free to ask you problem solving. It can be coding. It can be any kind of problem solving or it can be a design as well. So if you see the culture, it's just one coding, actual coding type of question, which people used to ask before a lot. Similarly for Uber, I, I remember there was one round which Uber was the toughest interview I've given ever in my life. Uber's first round was prob probably uh, coding. They had they had some graph question, which they asked me around BFS and something like that. And then the second round was pretty tough. It's called the machine coding round, in which they ask you to actually implement a working code on your ID on a screen share in a two hour interview, where they give you a very vague question in which it has multi-threading. How do you test your code in multi-threading using countdown latches and stuff like that? So I was asked something around the lines of writing code for a pub sub model or a Kafka type of a model, right? In a two-hour interview. And trust me, it's not easy to come up with the classes, the interaction, the synchronization. Yeah, it was tough. And then there was a high-level design round, and there was a mid-level design come managerial cup leadership principle round. So that that's, this is the transition I've seen. Like now people have st started slowly shifting from the core data structures to like a bit of real life kind of problems or the problems in which you based upon what the real SD twos or SD threes work upon these days. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And as you mentioned, like, I think, I think for me, the most difficult interview was at Uber, I would say, because it, uh, while preparation, I had to prepare for multiple avenues. After that, I would say uh, Amazon was tough because uh, I, I interviewed here for an SD3 role okay. and the expectations are pretty high. 
in terms of how you design the systems and it was highly design focused and low level design focused and i would say like face facebook and google were not that tough mostly because uh, i would say i was very well prepared in terms of data structures and algorithms and there was only one area of concentration i had to concentrate upon for the like two months which is just coding so i was able to do that that's why i felt easy i wouldn't say it's easy mm-hmm. it, i felt it easy because i had like a uh, streamlined kind of stuff which i had to prepare but for other companies i had to you know prepare different avenues so system design low level logical and maintainable code data structure so it's kind of tough so yeah. uh, in every amazon interview they have their questions on coding but they also incorporate questions on leadership principles so sort of mm-hmm. behavioral questions we say which yeah. we are expected yeah. to answer in the star panel so as yeah. you mentioned that in meta and google there were only coding based problems so do you expect in that one particular interview of coding to only have coding questions and not those behavioral questions or do they have those also in it i think for meta uh i had no behavioral questions asked maybe just one in one round that's it it uh in google they had a special round called googliness round that's the round in which they ask all the leadership type of questions which they have to ask in just one interview it's not spread across multiple interviews but in amazon it's spread across all the interviews right yeah so yeah. and you are expected to give all the interviews in one shot at every place so if you have five rounds you give it in a go for five hours or something like that oh no no it's not like that no. it's totally the companies are very flexible so they are flexible enough to give you enough time for example i i found google to be most flexible they can give you if you ask like hey i had my first coding round it it did it didn't go that well it went aver- average can you give me 3 weeks to prepare more so that after that i can give those next 3 rounds and they're like quite accommodating because companies are interviewing you because they want to hire you right so they give you the best possible shot they can sometimes it's not possible because uh companies are like doing a hiring spree in which they call their all their interviewers or multiple like candidates together to a place in a campus and they have all their interviewers and they you need to interview everything in one day but in general when you are like interviewing virtually it's generally fine right and yeah uh, you said that you are very good in uh, data structures and algorithms so it made it pretty easy for you to crack meta or google but let's say someone who is not very good in uh, these areas so what do you suggest to them how do how should they prepare themselves for these interviews yeah i think i think uh, you become good as much as you practice uh prepare like doing different kind of problems and doing them more and more gives kind of gives you a way to to understand like how to think like for example you don't have to memorize the problems you kind of get to understand the way a problem is approached so once you understand that particular way in how to approach a problem it becomes quite simple i would say uh, there are a lot of like gurus these days on youtube which kind of talk about the plans or how how to become better at lead coding and stuff like that i think it's not that bad to follow them given if they are having free courses i don't think you have to pay them for the courses there are a lot of good good courses available on youtube and which are already there and there are cheat sheets available so people can follow that and i think lead code is a pretty good avenue to become better better at lead data structures and algorithms a lot uh that's what i would say I, what i used to do is i used to prepare for a topic by topic so if i'm doing graphs uh i've understood what pfs is what dfs is i go to you go on lead code filter out the questions based upon bfs and dfs start from easy a couple of easy questions a couple of medium questions a couple of hard questions and that's it so it kind of gives you a total kind of gist in which in what in what all are the ways these kind of questions can be framed so yeah yeah and i think the same for system design you can just find things on internet i think system design is a uh, quite an extensive topic i would say there is uh not 
the, like there are variety of sources that you have to learn and you have to keep learning. There is no end to system design. But for in terms of interviews, I think uh, there have been a few channels on YouTube which I followed, which were pretty good. And uh, I've also seen there is another platform called Interview Ready, which is kind of a plate platform, but they give you like in some bucks, they give you the access to their website or their design courses for like lifetime. I think it's pretty cheap, like 5,000 bucks. Uh, five thousand rupees for for the course. I don't remember how much it is how much it is now, but if you are just if you are just preparing for like SD two kind of roles, I would say YouTube is a good avenue to understand system design. But if you are preparing for higher level roles like SD three kind of roles, uh, I would say go for certain good in the industry courses, which can give you a variety of ways to understand upon. See, it's not mostly about you have to solve the problem in the system design interview. Nobody expects you to solve a complete problem. People generally see like how you approach a problem. So if I'm asking you to develop, let's say, a recommendation system on Amazon, it's not like you have to completely design a recommendation system in Amazon. It's mostly around talking about what are the functional requirements, what are the not functional requirements, how much scale are we planning to see Based upon the scale, what kind of load it would would it be? It would it be a read heavy database? Would it be a write heavy database? And accordingly, you choose a database for that. Right? Uh, so, and then how how does your how does your how does your code work? Like, how does it interact? Do you have do you need any kind of APIs? Uh, what kind of API would that be? Get post put what what would be the structure? So it's like more like stuff around that. Uh, then there can be other things like how do you how do you run some more synchronous workflows? How do you uh, have any kind of a pre-compute system? So, for example, people might ask you if you're designing a recommendation system, how do you recommend product? So you have to come up with some kind of an idea like, hey, let's say I would find a product which is matching the category of this given product. But you have to yourself say like, hey, would, would I do it in real time? Like, would I go and hit my back end to find it in real time? No, right? You'll have to do some kind of pre-computation. Then the question comes, how would you do that pre-computation? So for you to be prepared around all these kind of questions, you should have like a thorough understanding of the system design. So I would say, go out there on YouTube, understand from various sources, and it will definitely make you a better software engineer, not just for cracking interviews, I would say, but in terms of your day-to-day -day work as well, because you'll be able to understand well and suggest well. All right. Uh, that was some valuable information on interviewing. I'm sure yeah. uh, our audience will like that and take some valuable yeah. insights from it. Yeah, I think one more thing I would like to add is like, apart from coding and system design, a very important aspect is the leadership principle questions in which people ask you about your past experiences. Like, for example, when did you simplify have you ever seen a process that was not very good and you volunteered to simplify it? People generally come up with vague answers. They're not prepared for it. They try to make up an answer from, I would say make up an answer. They try to remember a situation from their past experience. But sometimes the situation doesn't match the question or sometimes the example they are bringing up isn't like very heavyweight. It's like pretty light. But if you, if you would have like thought about it before, or if you if you are well prepared, you would be able to give your best possible example in that particular question. And trust me, raising the bar in leadership principles is very very important. So, to all your viewers, I would suggest like when you're coming for an interview for system design and coding, the leadership principles are equally important. So, write down your leadership principles. For each of them, have two examples written in a star format, and remembered by you so that you can give your best shot in that it kind of increases your uh, possibility of getting hired a lot because i've seen a lot of people getting rejected and they are posting on various platforms like hey i did everything in the coding question i did everything in the system design where did i go wrong it's basically you messed up in the leadership principles and that's where you went wrong right so prepare well for them as yeah. well i took part in a few interviews uh recently and i saw the same thing physically uh, mm -hmm. People prepare for coding, but they miss out this 
this big giant called uh, behavioral questions and that's where yeah. they kind of get stuck when uh, the interviewer asks you questions so i think preparing for that is also very important yeah thanks for that valuable yeah. insight all right so uh, we interviewed let's say we got into these companies so mm-hmm. how, how different is the working culture between these companies what what how would you compare them mm-hmm. okay let's let's do a comparison in amazon and meta here so in amazon when you get hired you get hired for a particular team like let's say you'll join this particular team you come to that team each team has their onboarding process defined like when a new person comes they'll have to go through this 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 documentation set up their development environments or read through these workflows and start their first project which be, would be a small one which is already decided this is what happens in amazon but meta is quite different so in meta when you join you are a part of a boot camp so boot camp is like a 8 week process in which the multiple teams kind of send you requests like think of it like friend request that hey we want to we want you to be part of our team we want you to be a part of our team so what you do is you maybe sit with that team for like two or three days they give you a small task like a small task with a minimal complexity you kind of work up on that task complete that task it gives you an idea of what kind of work that team does and if you think you are interested in that kind of team you can say hey i'm ready to join you but if you think you're not you can just move on to the next team sit with them and you get 8 weeks to do this oh. so i kind of sat with around 5 teams before deciding which team i want to go in so which was which which i found like pretty interesting because some people they might be interested in like very back end heavy teams some might be interested or very disinterested in uh, operationally overloaded yeah. teams so you can just choose so th- these are kind of two things which are different in the two companies i would say when you get hired but after that i think it's it's kind of similar once you get to a team it's all similar you get small tasks then you get bigger tasks yeah that's pretty much it yeah i think google also has a similar process called team matching so once you are through yeah. and they say that yes we are going to hire you you basically go through interviewing uh, different kinds of teams and then you ask questions to the managers of those teams and then you decide which team you want to join i think something similar uh, happened to me here in amazon i once i was through mm-hmm. the interviews i was uh, uh, like i was assigned three managers who with whom i had to take calls and then i asked mm-hmm. some questions to them and based upon that i decided to join which team i have to join so yeah the difference is like in google you have to do a team match before you get the actual offer and in meta so if you don't team match you won't be able to join but in meta you're already hired you're in the office yeah. and then once you start matching right. team yeah yeah that's yeah. the difference i think once you uh, go over the team matching only then you uh, get onboarded into that company yeah that's true yeah so any interesting uh, insights or stories that you want to share from these companies or any interesting work you did from there yeah i think i think meta is a pretty charming company i think uh they have moved fast as one of their imbibing cultures in which you are supposed to deliver pretty quickly and uh, there's some they work on technologies they have developed by themselves like graphql react js so the internal documentations are pretty pretty good so you get to wrap up pretty quickly they write their back end code in hack lang which is not popular in the industry but very popular within meta the other good things are like you get free food for three times a day and it's pretty good you get free protein shakes as well nice so, well, for the gym lovers which is again good yeah for the gym lovers and they fly you business class as well oh. so whether you are an sd1 or if you are a principal engineer you they fly you business class if it's greater than 4500 miles which is generally the case so which i found pretty cool i mean luxurious i would right. say uh yeah 
yeah but I, I would say like they have kind of a move fast culture so you are expected to ship product out ship products out pretty quickly and uh in amazon it kind of varies from team to team but in amazon as well i feel like you can be in good teams you can be in bad teams but in general if you are in amazon i think you'll you learn and grow a lot uh various teams have various good aspects and the bad aspects might be bad for certain people i would say not in general because i've seen like some people they don't want to go in a team which is tier 1 by tier 1 i mean the highest impact in team because they feel like the operational burden is high the operational load yeah. is high yeah and that's a bad trade for them but for some people they want to go in that team because they feel like they're doing some work which is like valued across the platform so kind of varies but what i would say is amazon is a pretty good place to learn it has very very so, very very a bunch of very very good engineers i would say so you'll always you'll always keep learning a lot of stuff uh yeah that's that's what i can say all right so let's say you work for a certain company and then you decide to switch for x factors mm -hmm. how do you prepare yourself for a switch between companies because if you are working for these companies they completely use different technologies not relevant in yeah. general other general companies they have their own technology so how do you prepare yourself for a switch in those scenarios how do you do that i mean you don't prepare for certain technologies for sure there might be certain roles in which you have to prepare like for example if you're getting hired for a security engineer or you're hiding for a you're getting hired for a database administrator you might have to prepare for certain things in which the company is already specify like oh uh, if you have a background in this it you would be preferred but in general software engineering i think you just prepare for general stuff like getting better at coding and getting better at system design so it's kind of hard to prepare while you are you are having a job so please make sure you don't slag on your current yeah. job while you're trying to switch because it's not it's not a good thing uh i used to prepare like in the night so i used to spend like 2 to 3 hours every night like for, from 11 am to like 2 11 pm to like 2 am because it was silent all around at that time and i could just concentrate so i think it's a good strategy i would say i mean it kind of disintegrates your work which you completed at 5 pm gives you enough time to chill and you can prepare in the night and how do you stay up to date yeah. with the current tech world uh it's it's difficult i mean you can't stay like completely up to date with the current tech world especially when you are working for a certain team you have to i mean you can when the when by up to date i would say like you don't need to know about the depth of everything but a surface level knowledge might also be helpful because when you are preparing for you're let's say you're doing a certain system design within your team on a project so if you kind of know about a particular technology it might be good that you can you know that i have to, it is it can be one of my options that i can explore that so i mean there's nothing much you can do to stay like completely up to date i would say yeah but i generally just i think linkedin is linkedin has been a pretty good avenue for me in these terms like i follow all these companies like uber blogs and amazon blogs they keep on posting around what new is coming in aws how did uber solve a particular problem so it kind of gives you a just like what is happening around in the industry and what might be a possible solution also i feel like your senior engineers are like a charm for you so when they are there uh try to listen to them as much as you can and try to gauge as much as you can from them rather than trying to show them like you know a lot as well you know a lot as well just listen to them i think you'll learn a lot yeah that's a yeah. valuable advice yeah all right so uh as as i mentioned earlier at the start you are also my mentor here at amazon so how, yeah. what is a mentor to you and how how is it important uh to get a mentor at these companies or at any company mentor for you i think it's getting a good mentor is pretty important uh i once read a quote on linkedin it said like be the senior you always wanted to have so which means kind of 
do things to the people who are junior to you or who are, who are learning from you, which one, once you see it, like you have, for example, like if let's say you don't have a mentor right now and you struggle with a few things and you wish like, Hey, if someone would have told me this, I would have been 10 X better at this. So it's your duty when you become a senior to make sure that you self help someone so that they don't have to face the same kind of problem. And that that's why I feel like a mentor is important. So when you are an engineer and a mentor is not just important for an SDE one SDE two, I think even the principal engineers have a mentor, which are senior to them. The mentor can guide you in various ways. For example, it can be company specific things. Uh, let's say you don't know how to approach something. Let's say you're having a problem with your manager and you are kind of furious, like something is not happening the way you want to. I think a few words of wisdom from your mentor, because he's been in the company from a while would be useful because they kind of know what the culture is and what kind of happens behind the books. And secondly, uh, they can put you on the right side of processes. So let's say you are not able to, let's say you're coding up well, but you are getting a lot of revisions in your code. So they can guide you up in the way, like how can you reduce the number of revisions or how can you code better? Or is there, are you getting the revisions because you're writing bad code or is it because there is a difference in expectations between you and your, the peer you're working with? And if you're getting more revisions is talking to them offline and getting a review done before a good thing or not. So they can kind of guide you these things, which you are not aware about. So that's where I think like getting a mentor is important. I know you always need someone to talk to who you can trust. And I think developing a, getting a mentor and developing a trust with him or her is very important. It kind of gets you going in yeah. the company. Next, I was going to ask how to be a good mentor to your mentee, but I think your answer summarizes that as well. So, yeah, I think, I think just be, just be empathetic, like. Just think like if you were in that situation and generally you have been in that situation, you face difficulties, make sure like you make sure you understand what the other person is facing and you give them the right suggestion, just not to please them, but what is useful yeah. for them. Like, for example, if somebody comes to me and say, Hey, I want to get promoted to an, from an SD to, to an SD three, let's say, or SD one to SD two, let's say, uh, to make them happy, I can say, hey, you're already there. But the right thing for me to say would be, hey, let's go through your document, identify the areas of gap so that we can work upon them in the next three months. So that when you go to your manager for a proposal to keep your promotion on, you're, you're backed up with data points. And there are kind of, I would say, I would not say there are no gaps, but there are less gaps in what where you are and where you want to be. So these kind of things are important being a mentor. I would say don't just sugarcoat, but also tell what the yeah. truth is. It might be harsh, but it would be useful yeah, eventually. Second that because that's the process that we followed for my promotion as well. And yeah. you helped a lot there and you identified the points where I had to focus more and then you helped me achieve that. So thank you for being a great mentor. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dhruvam. I think you did a pretty good job. I think. You have worked a lot. You had a lot of work done already. So for the audience, we kind of worked, we kind of sat together and went through all the work that Dhruvam, have done, Dhruvam, Dhruvam had done. And we kind of saw that uh, Dhruvam has all the data points, but Dhruvam had not articulated them clearly of what all he has done. So that kind of articulation and writing them well helped him to gauge confidence, to get confidence of his manager and he was able to own the trust and get promoted. So I think that's where a mentor yeah, can help really. you. Any rewarding experiences for you from your mentor that you want to share? From yeah. my past mentor? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, sometimes the same kind of dilemma I am in as well. So let's say recently what happened with me was I was in a dilemma of whether I should take a project, which is critical for me or uh, uh, critical for my team to work upon or whether I should take a project that kind of aligns with my, what my leadership wants me to do. So he gave me a pretty good advice that the product 
always come before engineering. So my leadership wanted me to work on a certain kind of product, but I wanted to work on a project which was, I was already invested in, which was improving the architecture of our code base. So it gave me a pretty good advice that your whatever you do, the product, the money is what matters to the company. So focus more on the product and not in the engineering side. I mean, it is important, but that is the first priority. And I think that was pretty good because the work in engineering I was doing, it was difficult to implement because we had a humongous code base. And because there were no visible results of that, maybe a few engineers would have appreciated it, but maybe the leadership not. They would have felt like I just wasted some of the time and accomplished no results. But when I worked on a product, it made company some good amount of revenue in much lesser period of time. And it was appreciated like throughout. So if if I won't have a mentor, like if he wasn't there, I would have probably said like, hey, I'm already like 50% done in this. I need to just spend 50% more time and I would just get this done and I won't do the next, next thing, which would have reflected badly on me. So I think these kind of things are kind of important. And this is where your mentor and your manager comes right. in. So just the last question here, uh, what's next for Gaurav? Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I do plan to I do plan to stay in the US in the same company for like maybe next three years at least. Uh the reason being like the space I'm currently in, it's pretty technically challenging and it has a good three year or five year roadmap already aligned up. And I'm pretty interested about that. And I have made significant contributions in developing that plan as well. So I think I'm gonna stay put for the next three to four years and I had my fair share of switches in the last past couple of years. So I feel like if you keep on switching just for a few bucks, you won't ever end up being a good engineer because every few months you'll be just learning the same stuff you have already done again and again, rather than developing the actual skills. So for me next is just to stay put here for a few years and keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And then maybe move to a new country after that. All right. So that brings us to the end of this podcast thank you for doing this you have been great yeah thank you so much. thank you thank yeah. you so much thank you for yeah thank you for having me and thank you for having codeflix as a platform i think uh you as a, you as a owner of this platform have been putting in a lot of effort to bring in some good content for people and i think it would be useful for the people as well to learn from people what actually is happening in the industry rather than just going th just going through people who are just say quote unquote just youtubers and they are not working really in the industry and just have worked like for a couple of years i think you provide people with a good avenue and the other thing is you yourself are a software engineer who is currently working so i think you're able to put a good perspective from your side as well it's that the conversation is just not not like one-sided you are able to put in your contributions, which is something I appreciate whenever I talk to a podcaster. So thanks for all the doing, doing all the good work. And I would say, keep doing it. Never stop. Yeah. Thanks for those kind words. And thank you for joining this. Enterprise.